Rani, I'll get started. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone, from wherever you're logging in. Today, we have uh, Dr. Rohini Pandey, who is a distinguished economist and also the Henry J. Hines II Professor of Economics and Director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University, speaking at the Virtual Research Healthcare Seminar Series at CMHS IM Ahmedabad. Rohini has held faculty positions at the Kennedy School earlier. Uh, she is now the co-director of the CID Evidence for Policy Design Research Program. Several accomplishments. Um, I'm a big fan of Rohini's work, to say the least. Uh, so over to you, uh, Rohini, to talk about whether democracy can work for the poor. Thanks, Chirantan. It's uh, great to be here. And just as you noted, uh, I moved to Yale a year and a half ago. So I'm actually now at the Economic Growth Center at Yale, which is which I direct. and. It's had a lot of engagement with Indian academics over the years, and I hope uh, we can continue that going ahead. Um, just in terms of uh, timing, Chirantan, I want to check uh, how long you wanted me to go for, given that- So uh, the plan of the, <clears throat> yeah, so you can go for 45 minutes and we have 15 minutes Q&A at the end. If there are interventions, people can put it on the chat window and I can come in about, if whenever you want to stop, like about 20 minutes into the talk, we can take a pause and look at the chat window. Sure. So um, I'm very happy to take questions and comments as we go along. So I'm going to start, as you can see, uh, I've put up the roadmap of the talk. And so, uh, I mean, I'm happy to take pauses as I, as I go through different sections. But, uh, you know, always, Chirantan, just feel free to stop me if you see something in the chat that Indeed. I haven't seen. So let me start with, um, I think, a graph that many of us are very familiar with, which is you know, the dramatic decrease that we have seen in global poverty the world over. So what this graph shows you is that the dark blue line is, shows you from 2000, but I could have put this back to 1980 and it would have looked the same. You know, a dramatic decline between 1980 and 2020 of from roughly 40% of the world's population living under at or under $1.90 a day. Roni, you have to go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, you can't see my next slide? I am on my next. Okay, great. So this was the slide I was on. So as I was saying, when you look at this over time, what you see is this uh, significant decline in uh, world poverty, uh, which you know has been identified by many uh, individuals. But what, what I think is important to see is two things. First, of course, is the important role played by South Asia. So we see this very steep decline um, in poverty in South Asia from more than um, 35% to roughly around 15% um, uh, by, uh, or less than 15% by the time we had the last data, which was in 2011, 12, and a continued projected uh, decline. Now, of course, what we know is that this has been transformed by COVID. What COVID has done is that it has meant that we're going to see the first increase in poverty um, post, sorry, somehow something else seems to have happened. Uh, see, see the first uh, increase in poverty since the since the start of the 21st century. And a lot of this increase is going to be based in, in India. So Chirantan, if you can go to the next slide. So, sorry, just looking at Can you see it? Uh, yeah, I can see it, great, thanks. So uh, what this next slide shows us is another feature which is about the geographic distribution of poverty across the world. In particular, what we see is that in, you know, in 1987, the world's poor lived in poor countries. But now what you, have, what you increasingly see is that the world's poor are living not in, not in poor countries, but in what we would call high poverty middle income countries. So by 2015, India was home to 176 uh, million of the world's poor. And the majority of the world's poor, in fact, lived in countries like India, Nigeria, Indonesia, large populous countries that are growing fast, but remain uh, home to large populations of the world's poor. So if you can go to the next slide. And so what we see in the next slide is that these declines in these increases in poverty that are going to follow on post the post the 
pandemic. The pandemic are really going to be concentrated in countries like India. So what this shows you is a comparison of the levels of poverty in these countries in pre-COVID and then the projections as of October 2020. And so again, what you see here is very significant increases in countries like India, Nigeria, certainly some also in, in uh, countries that are poor, like uh, the Democratic Congo Republic, but a lot of it is coming from countries like India. Now, if you go to the next slide, what we, look, what we see is that one of the big responses across the world has been through social protection programs. So in the last nine months, roughly $800 billion have been invested by countries and by aid agencies across countries. Um, and an interesting phenomenon alongside has been a greater use of cash transfers. So over a third of these have been targeted as cash transfers to, uh, to individuals. But at the same time, these are relatively small, uh, short lived. So, you know, uh, the Indian experience with three months of cash transfers uh, during COVID lockdown and just after is actually very consistent with the average for the world. So the cash transfers on average lasted just 3.3 months. And in many cases, what we see is that these um, transfers were also uh, not adequate. So, uh, Around the time of the lockdown and the start of transfers in India, uh, I and my colleagues did some estimates for, uh, for India. We both used existing uh, survey data to estimate you know, what would be the levels of exclusion from the existing programs. And what we found is that for cash transfers, because they were tied to PMJDY accounts, and many of India's poor women don't have PMJDY accounts, we estimated that roughly 53% of those targeted by these uh, cash transfers were actually going to be unable to get them. The levels of exclusion were less so for food transfers. The public distribution ration system has much wider spread, but it was still the case that around 20% of um, you know, poor women would, would not be able to get food transfers. We also conducted a significant amount of qualitative work and you know, this just gives you some examples of the type of institutions that uh, limited access other than not having uh, possibly um, just an account. Um, so for instance, you know, it could be that bank officials are the gatekeepers to your access. And if they don't find your uh, ID, you don't get it. In other cases, you know, women would report that during, especially during the lockdown, uh, there was sufficient fear of how the police would in engage with them if they left the house that they chose not to. As I said, food transfers were more successful, but they were also relatively short-lived. And if you move to the next slide, what we see is um, that, you know, particularly groups of, of disadva historically disadvantaged groups, for instance, women or um, lower caste, are ones who we would worry in the longer run are going to have a harder time getting back into the labor force. Right, so these are the ones who've seen the CMIE estimate, for instance, suggests that um, you know, the number of women looking for jobs or employed is 10 percentage points higher than what we see for men. And we also find that the availability of private jobs has significantly declined. <coughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm putting up forward these facts as a way of really motivating this question of, you know, what is happening with the state, especially the democratic state, when it's trying to respond to its poor citizens. So if we zoom out again, and if we go to the next slide, what we see is that the decline in poverty over the last, um, you know, four or five decades was also uh, accompanied by a transformation of the nature of the state in which uh, low income, how, uh, you know, in which the world's poor lived. So what you see here is that in 1985, this is using data from the Varieties Democracy Index that seeks to uh, measure the world's poor uh, and you know, not just, sorry, it needs to measure the types of democracy people live under. And so what you see that in 1985, roughly 50% or of the world's poor lived in uh, countries that were largely not democratic. The classic example of that being 
today being China. And you can see that by 2015, it's a very small share of the world's poor that live in countries that have very limited democracy and it's largely driven by China. On the other hand, what you do see is that while increasingly um, the world's poor live in countries that have uh, elections, they may not have a lot of the other features that we would want a functioning democracy to have. In particular, they may not be very egalitarian in terms of how the redistribution system works. And that really is the question that's motivating uh, you know, my, my uh, research and this talk is really trying to understand what will it take to take existing democracies and make them function better from the world's poor. You can see that the majority of the world's poor are now living in countries that have you know, on average clean elections, but are pretty low on the egalitarian in, uh, component index. And so just to give you a sense of the marker, so the top line, uh, the dark red, is where the egalitarian index is around 0 0.7. A country that falls in that category is Vietnam. And since I know, um, you know, health issues are particularly of interest to this audience, I would highlight that, you know, for instance, Vietnam is a country that has been incredibly successful in its response to COVID on the health side. So if you go to the next slide, we also saw that at the same time as we saw, uh, you know, the pandemic affect uh, uh, poverty outcomes, we also saw significant democratic backsliding across a lot of the world. So, you know, according to the IDEA database, um, in many cases, understandably because of social distancing, but you know, elections have been postponed or canceled in at least 75 countries. Um, the Freedom House report uh, called Democracy Under Lockdown suggests that the democracy and human rights conditions worsened in over 80 countries. And many countries saw new restrictions on protests. Interestingly, what we saw alongside is uh, prima facie, uh, citizens often did not respond uh, very strongly. So there's a large set of surveys done across countries suggesting that citizens were sometimes willing to state that they would trade off civil liberties in order for improved public health conditions. However, this trade-off was uh, less strong among the more disadvantaged. So the more disadvantaged in the society were less willing to say that they are going to be willing to trade off civil liberties for improved public health conditions. And I think that probably reflects in part the fact that if you're reasonably well off, you very often are going to be opting outside the state for services. And you're perhaps also more secure in your ability to uh, navigate different institutions that a state has. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind that when we often hear this rhetoric that much of uh, uh, the restrictions are uh, favored by the state, by citizens, as long as public health improves, there may be very significant variation across uh, the society. So if you move to the next slide, uh, this slide is from same uh, data source, the varieties of democracy. And it again, just uh, shows that post, um, post the pandemic, we see a significant decline in uh, many types of uh, violations of democratic standards. And the, perhaps the one that is, I think, very striking and seems to be happening across the world in a lot of places is this type seven of restrictions on media. So you see very significant evidence that this has also uh, moved. And you know, uh, lower income countries or these high poverty middle income countries that we identified appear to be at higher risk. So that's the next slide. So where does this leave us? And so if you go to the next slide, which is the roadmap, what I really want to do is against this background, step back for a second and ask, why is it that in many places uh, we are seeing um, an inability for, if you want, technocratic policy making to be sufficient in responding to the citizens' preferences, particularly uh, lower income citizens. And why is it at this point uh, when we see poverty rising, it's not going to be enough to think about technocratic fixes, but importantly, we need to be returning to thinking about how do we actually um, uh, move towards strengthening democracies and making democracies work for the world's poor.
So before I move um, ahead, let me just stop here for a second to see if there are any questions or... Uh... Yeah, I don't, <clears throat> I don't see questions, but if somebody has a question, you can uh, put it on the chat window and we can unmute you and you can ask it. Okay, one great. one yeah, one yeah. point I want to ask Roini is, yeah. uh, you are comparing to a pre-period which is quite long to a post-period which is just twelve months down. So, in some sense, this is partial equilibrium uh, in terms of that the fact that poverty may have deepened and deepened more for certain sections of the population, while democracy is backsliding and media is uh, facing a pushback. Any are you concerned about the fact that it's just 12 months and this is only going to be the direction it's going to head towards or there could be some force corrections on both sides, on the de uh, dependent variable side as well as uh, on the independent variable side? So I think certainly, you know, I think, I think projections are always hard to make. I think the one thing I, I would kind of note is that historically when we've had these kind of negative shocks, what we mm -hmm. find is that there are points when uh, you see inequality rising. So, uh, you know, many people, for instance, talk about uh, V-shaped recovery, but I think the data typically suggests that what's more common is to perhaps see something that you would call a K-shape, that mm. even if uh, economic activity recovers and some set of the population does better, the poor or the disadvantaged are a particular risk of getting even left behind even more. And so certainly the initial trends we are seeing in terms of, for instance, um, children's ability to continue to remain engaged with education through schools being shut is very mm -hmm. different across the income distribution. And those are things that I think are harder to correct, investments in human capital. Okay, Tarun has a question, uh, my colleague here. I'll just yeah. unmute him and he can ask. Tarun, please go ahead. So Rohini, I was uh, intrigued by that uh, you know, uh, graph data that you showed that the yeah. governments have been restricting media in response to COVID. I mean, a logical you know, uh, thought that I had is that fear media actually aids in COVID mitigation. Yeah. Whereas, and I was surprised to see that this is a broader trend, not just in India, that uh, there have been more restrictions on media um, yeah. across the country, across the world. So could you just comment a little bit on perhaps your thoughts on why that might be the case? So I think the, I think this is reflected to, um, you know, the question of, you know, what, what, what one thinks transparency brings. So uh, you could have a perfectly you know, well-meaning government believe that at a point in time like this, what you really want to do is uh, prevent uh, any kinds of non-verified news getting out. So, you know, you may be concerned, for instance, about rumor mongering or such activities. So it really is, I think, as I said, if you think the social planner is trying to optimize uh, uh, welfare, it could well be that the big constraint that they're seeing is an inability to uh, identify, um, you know, the types of news coming out. But I think, you know, more generally, um, this is um, I, I, this is in some ways just kind of a set of facts I'm presenting. I don't, I haven't looked enough at it to be able to know why this is happening. But you know, that would be uh, one argument. I mean, that's a similar argument, for instance, why we've seen elections being delayed. I mean, those are those are very clearly just social dis uh, social distancing. Um, uh, related arguments for why you would uh, reduce protests or why you would reduce uh, elections. I agree with you that media is perhaps less clear, but I think you know one argument would be if you believe you can't, uh, you want you want to you want to uh, prevent uh, rumor mongering. Thanks, Roini. All right, you can. I think you can go ahead and we can come okay, back great. to other questions. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, uh, what I wanted to do is sort of just revisit a little bit um, these thoughts about uh, development, uh, research and policy and kind of try to put it against in the background of uh, put it against the, the structure of where I'm going, which is arguing the value of democracy. So historically, if you think about what the development community has done, it has relied on two levers to get people out of poverty. One is economic growth, and then the other is intentional redistribution. 
So if you click to the next bullet point, Chirantan. In the 1990s, there was a strong uh, view um, the, and advocacy that what you need to be doing and, as international uh, agencies or as uh, bilateral aid is providing untied funds for countries, for instance, for them to be able to undertake public sector investments. And there was, very, there was a very famous push towards debt cancellation, for instance, through the Jubilee 2000. This was followed in the early 2000s, I think in the broader community with a concern of, of corruption that if you provide untied funds uh, or you have debt cancellation, uh, you would have, for instance, uh, uh, governments in countries building up large amounts of debt and then sort of disappearing off um, with money in their Swiss bank accounts. And I sort of see th this concern as really having been the precursor for, so if you click on the next bullet point, Chirantan, uh, for this sort of experimental welfare oriented uh, research response of the 2000s. And this was, I think, very much this thought that if we can somehow uh, quantify program costs and benefits, you could possibly then enable um, this value for money metric that would work for development programs. And increasingly where we see this going and you know, places like the bank, for instance, have been emphasizing this in the case of education is uh, have a more technocratic policy narrative. So uh, you can have actors can look at the data, they can look at what works and how much it costs and then choose your preferred best buy. Now, if you go to the next slide, in the case of sort of social protection, which is I think one of the most important uh, policy programs under consideration right now, a common metric is going to be how do you implement transfers in low capacity environments? So how do you actually ensure that the poor get um, the, say the cash transfers during COVID or whatever longer term measures are going to be put in place while excluding the non-deserving? Um, and so if you click through to the next uh, couple of bullet points, uh, Chirantan, what you see is that, you know, um, there's increasingly important focus on how we can, for instance, use digital financial services. So to me, this is uh, what I would say is a technocratic fix to say, let's fix the identity and how we reach individuals. And that may help us, uh, you know, move towards a case of lower reduction in corruption. And the question I think, and this is where we start seeing, um, you know, in some ways the limits of technocratic policy making is, to, I think you can pose the question very clearly as, if you manage to reduce corruption in a social program, does that necessarily expand the pie of resources available for the poor? So let me turn to some work I've done on the Enriga program in India to, uh, you know, almost sort of provide uh, a case study on this. So if you go to the next slide, what you see uh, on the graph, and I think this is, uh, I'm sure, well known to everyone in this audience, is, you know, Enria has been one of the main um, social protection schemes in response to COVID. So what you see here in 2020 is a sharp jump up in the household demand um, in 2020 relative to the average for 2016 to 19. Uh, you know, there's been a roughly a 45% increase in demand. So if you go to the next slide, what you see on the next slide, which is uh, striking is that in contrast, the state responsiveness, so the number of working days uh, per capita has actually not seen such a fast, uh, such, uh, such a response in terms of responding more in states with more poor individuals. So the states that did well in being able to provide more work days but really, if you want the kind of typical, um, you know, well-performing states uh, like, say, Tamil Nadu, but interesting also a state like Rajasthan, which has had a long history of citizen activism around the right to work program. Um, you know, in contrast, a state like Bihar or UP, which have a high share fraction of uh, the poor, see uh, significantly less ability to respond. Now, one way to look at this is to say is that investments in technocratic state capacity, for instance, increasing uh, digital um, access to digital uh, systems could help here. So if you go to the next slide, I wanted to just kind of talk about one set of uh, work that I've done with co-authors, which sort of tell us both the importance of such reforms, but also possibly the limits if they don't uh, deal with uh, democratic functioning. So 
strengthening um, Enriga plumbing could reduce funds uh, leakage and help states respond to work demands. I think, uh, you know, Esther Duflo, who won the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago, has sort of uh, important work arguing the value of using evidence-based policy to, if you want, fix the leaks in the pipe of state delivery. So, so together with a set of co-authors, uh, what we did is we actually tried to experimentally examine one such attempt to fix the leaks in the, in the pipe, which is just-in-time financing, which was enabled by um, the digitization of the back end of uh, how uh, funds flow in the Enriga system. So what the, uh, what the digitization meant was that, you know, kind of in the status quo system, it used to be the case that um, gram panchayats uh, would put up their anticipated work orders or what they believe would be the work in the next three months up through the state machinery, get approvals from block district, and then get uh, funds released in advance of work. And then ex post, you would sort of uh, provide details of workers and then get, um, and then get um, your, your expenditures rationalized against the payments made to you upfront. What just-in-time financing meant was that you could just directly upload worker payments from a computer system at say the Gram Panchayat the block level, and that would provide the worker details and the work done to the bank. So what this meant by cutting out all these intermediating layers, uh, it will became possible to have just-in-time financing, which meant that say a worker works today, once the muster roll shuts for the Enriga uh, work, uh, you upload it, and then in theory, the worker should get payment within an, a few days. The two things this did was it obviously improved transparency because you actually, you're releasing funds against names of workers and it reduced the number of officials involved. So we ran this as, um, as, um, as a field experiment in conjunction with the government of Bihar. And what you see here is um, over the time period that the uh, intervention ran, which was for nine months from September to March, uh, you can see a significant decline in uh, funds flowing to the treatment gram panchayat. So there was a roughly uh, 230,000 uh, less rupees uh, went to, e to every treatment GP. Now, obviously you could look at this and be concerned that maybe one just created, you know, too technically complicated a system like in places where internet doesn't work very well you're not able to access um, you're not able to put up this inf uh, information easily and so um, the, the decline in work reflects actually an inability to service the work so if you go to the next slide what we did in the you know paper was spend a lot of time trying to understand where did this decline in uh, money come from and what we found is when we took the names of workers uh, showing up as having been paid on the MI system, and in both treatment and control, um, you know, sought to match it to actual households and surveys who said that they had worked, we found that there was a reduction of ghost workers in the treatment area. So this would be the case that, you know, there are fewer people showing up on the MIS roles who, when you go and ask them, did you work? They say, no, we didn't work. We also interestingly found uh, using the affidavits. So in Bihar at this point in time, all the panchayat uh, and um, kind of block officials had to submit annual affidavits on their uh, assets and earnings. And we found a 14% decline in the median officials wealth. And, and so overall there's certainly smoking gun evidence that a significant, significant share of uh, what was happening was that the intervention or the plumbing reform was successful in reducing leakage. However, on the other hand, what it did not do, so if you can click through to the next set of points, is what it did not do, it did not increase work for the poor or reduce delays in payment. And so another way of thinking what happened, which is the last bullet point on the political economy of reform, is that you know the government, the central government in particular, appreciated the decline in leakage. Um, this was, you know, uh, as we know, the fiscal deficits have been high for the, at the central level, but they didn't actually share uh, the state government's partisan identity and had less interest in in kind of seeing if there would be electoral returns from expanding the program, given that now there was less leakage through it. 
Equally, because this reform was one that occurred, if you want, largely within the state machine, it did not engage citizens and therefore it did not generate pressure for them to use the safe funds to expand the program. So overall, what we, I think, you know, technocratic reforms or these reforms that try to sort of increase the efficiency of the state machine for delivering social, uh, social programs is incredibly important, but in itself, it may not suffice to ensure that the poor are able to demand from a better functioning machine what they want. And so if you go to the next slide, I'm, I guess this is the end of the section, I really now want to turn to this question of why is it that if we want to have a democratic state that works for the poor, we need to go beyond fixing the plumbing of the redistributive state machine. But let me stop here again and see if there are any questions. So there's one pending question from uh, before about I think the media situation. Dr. Tripathi has asked how participatory communication can play its pertinent role to overcome such pathetic situation. I don't know. I think he was referring to those media numbers. I see. I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a good question. In fact, much of this talk is about thinking about participatory communication uh, or participatory uh, mechanisms. So um, hopefully I'll come to some of the ways in which we can achieve this as I go ahead. Okay, since there are no window, uh, no other chat interventions, I think you can go ahead. Okay, thanks. So if you go to the next slide, let me just sort of summarize my argument of why I think what we need if we really want to have sustainable and kind of ending to end to poverty and also more importantly, serving the more disadvantaged section of society, why we need more than a daily transfer dollar 90. So some of this, I think, came up in my qualitative description of why women in Madhi, rural women in Madhya Pradesh were often not collecting their COVID transfers is, you know, in order to have a sustained ability to earn an income, you need to have the physical safety to migrate, to work without fear of violence. You need to be able to save and withdraw money as you need it. And you need effective regulations. And if you click to the next slide, I think this is really where, what I would argue is that what we need is not a democracy that stops at saying, are we having elections and are those elections um, sort of free and, and fair. I think what's important to recognize that a functioning democracy is really a web of institutions, not just one institution. And, and many of those institutions, be they media, be they the judiciary or others, are have an important role in playing in ensuring that you know, the state responds to the needs of the poor. So if you go to the next slide, um, you know, if you think about what is the experience of being poor, I think much of it, especially in uh, what I call high poverty, middle income countries, countries that have, you know, significant set of resources uh, on average, it really is about institutional poverty. You know, so f first we know increasingly um, the poor are geographically concentrated. So, you know, 80% of the extreme poor live uh, the world over in rural areas where you have less access to government agencies, less reliable services, but also largely in slums. Uh, and this often limits their ability to be serviced by government agencies. They're more likely to be own account workers. This is something I think we saw post COVID, um, the issues that created, and they're often also socially isolated. So you may be uh, from a more disadvantaged caste, you may belong to uh, you know, groups like uh, being a woman in an area that has very conservative norms, all of these are going to limit your access to informal insurance and employment networks. So if you go to the next slide, I think recognizing that poverty is, is, is a lot of it is about being able to access institutions uh, is, tells us that um, we need more than plumbing improvements. Another way, I mean, if you really want to push the metaphor further, I think another way of thinking about it is you can have the best late plumbing system and uh, you, know, you can plug every hole in the pipes, but if someone doesn't open the sluices to let the water enter the machine, or if someone prevents you from getting to the taps at the other end, then the best plumbing isn't going to serve, uh, be enough to serve the poor. And so I think what we need to think about is, and this is a research agenda, how do we combine um, the important work that's been going on and thinking about the sort of uh, value for money, uh, best ref uh, plumbing reforms, 
to also start thinking about uh, democratic accountability. And so if you go to the next slide, and I think maybe this comes to uh, a little bit to uh, Professor Tripathi's question. Uh, you know, I think this is particularly pertinent, pertinent right now because um, governments are going to face a trade-off, right? Both industry is suffering and uh, workers are suffering. And so, and at-risk workers are often, uh, you know, lower skilled informal workers who lack unions and who were often the first to lose the jobs. And so they're going to very often have less ability to, um, uh, you know, lobby for benefits the same way as well-organized industry is. And this is something I think we're seeing the world over. We're seeing that as much in the US or Europe as in lower income countries that, um, governments perceive, dif perceive different stakeholders and are trying to figure out who should they support in order to get, bring about on economic. This is why I think it's particularly important right now to recognize that identifying the design of optimal COVID-19 policy, especially as we think about the longer run, as Chirantan mentioned, is going to require us to also think about uh, political imperatives and institutional design. And so if you go to the next slide, this brings me to kind of the next two points, which are really the, I think of as the positive research agenda on how we are learning about what we can do to strengthen the democratic state. And, and then finally, I want to conclude with some thoughts on the catch 22 of democratic reform. But let me again take a, a pause here if there are any questions. Don't see any. Okay, great. So if you go to the next slide, the next slide I think of as sort of summarizing what I call the human circle of governance. So if you think of many kind of plumbing reforms, what they tend to do is they tend to think about how do we get, you know, politicians to effectively delegate public policy to bureaucrats or how do we get lower level bureaucrats to ensure like frontline workers like teachers or health workers don't shirk and actually do their duty. What bringing in the democracy does is it adds in, if you want, the left-hand side, which says that, you know, sure, at one level, often what you're thinking about is how frontline workers are going to try to get citizens to undertake action. So right now in many countries, the big issue is how do, how do frontline workers get citizens to, under, to uh, get vaccinated? But of course, the extent to which you can, if you want, sort of force citizens to undertake actions is going to be limited by the fact that they are they're going to have democratic power. So that, if you want, is the top left-hand quadrant that tells you that in the end, the citizen is also able to um, push the politician through, elect, through points of election. Um, and very often, we tend to focus a lot on this sort of single election or electoral accountability at that point in time. But if you think about the whole policy making process, it isn't just the left quadrant. It's going to be thinking about improving state capacity and thinking about how do we bring in additional institutions? What are these additional institutions that the citizen perhaps cannot control through elections, um, you know, the judiciary, the police, but are important for, it, for how well the democracy actually works. So if you go to the next slide, you know, I think of reforms that we want that you want to use to address this sort of institutional poverty in a democracy is going to really be asking about, you know, how do we more broadly think of democratic institutions that can um, adequately rep represent those who are disadvantaged by power structures? In the end, you know, that, that I think is the central question is how do you have institutions that lead to a more equitable distribution of power? And here, as I said, is the I think of as the positive part of the research agenda, we have increasingly um, a, a role of, uh, of papers in the political economy of development that is beginning to identify uh, feasible reforms. So I'm, I'm, I can also see there's a few more questions now and I'm running a bit out of time. So let me just briefly give you a, a glimpse of one piece of research that I think of as falling in this sort of empirical political economy of development that takes politics seriously, and then turn to, I think, uh, a critical issue for all of us, which is the catch-22 of democratic reform. 
So if you go to the next slide, you know, I think one way you can try to move things is, is institutions that actually directly seek to affect uh, who represents the poor, right? So I think India, for instance, has had a long history uh, with electoral quotas, um, both for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and state legislatures and, and for women and scheduled tribes and scheduled castes at, at, at the Gram Panchayat level. There's a very nice paper in this and uh, in the American Political Science Review this year, kind of looking at um, the, uh, the scheduled areas uh, where uh, STs get kind of um, long-term uh, political office reservation. Uh, what they find is that in these in the scheduled areas, um, you, you see Enriga works more in favor of scheduled tribes. Again, it doesn't expand the pie, but increase, interestingly, what you find is that the gains for the ST in terms of more work are coming at the cost of what they think they describe as the relatively privileged, um, so the better off in the village, not other uh, low income disadvantaged households to compete with. Now there is, of course, um, you know, a long uh, literature and Esther and others have done important work here thinking about uh, gender quotas. I'd highlight again another recent work uh, from Delhi by um, uh, just a student who's just finished her PhD uh, thesis, Tanushri Goyal, who uh, makes the point that female candidates are actually also more likely to recruit women to run their campaigns. So she's looking at local municipal elections in Delhi. And what she finds is that as a result, this reduces the gender gap in political engagement. So, so I think ensuring ways of uh, providing disadvantaged groups uh, descriptive representation seems through multiple channels to both increase engagement and also improve, um, improve the policy preference representation they get. So if you go to the next slide, and this comes to perhaps one of the questions of um, what can uh, the media do? So this is a report card uh, from an inter the intervention that I and co-authors did in Delhi in the context of the municipal corporation elections, where we worked with an NGO that typically always produced uh, report cards based on um, kind of freedom of information, right to information, uh, act data they would get, especially on spending under the local area development funds. And we, this was part, what we did here was two years before the election. So in 2010, municipal councillors were sent letters saying that in 2012, just before the election, um, the Dainik Hindustan, which at that point was the second largest newspaper in Delhi, would be running these uh, report cards. So if you want, they were given two years advance notice that uh, their performance will become public. And this is against a setting, if you go to the next slide, where you see there's a huge, reasonably large disjunction, at least in the wards which have a large number of slums between slum developer preferences and politicians. So I think the world over this is true that politicians like spending on roads. They're both visible goods and you know, arguably contractors can uh, often uh, help with, for instance, um, you know, supporting electoral um, financing systems. But what you see here is the councillor spending on roads is just much higher than what the slums describe as their uh, problems um, they see are. So there's significant mismatch in the setting. And so if you go to the next slide, what we found overall is um, an important effect was that this made the incumbent councillors more responsive to spending priorities. And interestingly, we actually saw an institutional response also by parties. And so again, I think one of the key players in democratic settings often are political parties. And so thinking about how they have incentives to put up high performing uh, individuals provides another channel through which you can possibly uh, you know, push for reform. Um, another thing I would highlight is when you bring in players involved in protests into thinking about uh, as mainstream players in a democracy that can often be quite successful. So Nepal is a good example of this. Nepal is a country that has you know, transitioned after a 10-year people's war. Um, 
so, and we see there that um, in the 2017 elections, the groups that were brought in uh, out of the armed conflict as into mainstream parties were, were important in getting disadvantaged groups represented. So if you go to the next slide, and I'll just quickly go through this so that we then have at least 10 minutes for questions at the end. So let me describe what I see as the catch-22 of democratic reform. I think the catch-22 of democratic reform is we want to give power to the poor, the disadvantaged, but why should anyone have the incentive to do this, right? What is, who is going to play this role? Is this the role for outsiders to come from international development actors? Is it for something that should happen you know, within, within a country, you know, and, and so if you go to the next slide, I would argue that I think what's important is not where actors are located, but I think institutions can play an important role. Single individuals can get demonized a lot more easily than the role that an institution can play. This could be, for instance, through political parties. Uh, as if you can like, create ways for these institutions to develop that can represent the interests of the poor. I think unions is another good example of how one can actually find groups that would matter. So if you go to the next slide, I just put in place two uh, examples. Um, you know, one thing I think you, one can think about is advocacy. So examples of this, for instance, gender quotas didn't come out of nowhere. In 1995, the United Nations Women's uh, Conference in Beijing pushed very hard, uh, had a had a agreement that they will they will try to get gender quotas in place, and I think they've been very successful in playing a role of advocacy. It can sometimes be indirect. So in China, one of China's big successes in their war against pollution has been through creating these uh, transparency. Um, green supply chain maps where multinational corporations see the pollution performance of, you know, of factories that are supplying them. And so then um, the fact that they face uh, environmental pressures from the consumers in the endpoint country meant that they clean up along the supply chain. And then finally, I think if you go to the next slide, I think again, you know, democracy in the end needs transparency. Um, so, one thing I think is, is important to have proactive information disclosures. And so I think for aid agencies or for the World Bank or others who are thinking about financing uh, social protection acts right now, I think thinking about uh, moving to requiring proactive disclosures is going to be important. And then finally, and this is where let me end, is I think diverse representation is important. So no matter what institution one is in, whether it's uh, private sector or public, trying to move towards diversity means that you're going to, by definition, give voice to those who need it. So let me stop here. So just the last slide is thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and I apologize for the technical uh, issues getting started, but I'd, I'd love to move to a broader discussion now. So I'm going to put you back on uh, full screen mode. Uh, there are some questions on the chat yeah. window. Um, I can see a question from, I can't see the full name, but there's a question on UBI. There wasn't a ma massive push for a UBI type scheme in India, even during the lockdown. Do you see development or impact bonds as a viable, scalable alternative to invest in poverty elevation? If not, what market-oriented tools, if any, do you see as ambitious, impactful enough? So I think, you know, one of the big issues that countries like India or others, you know, that are um, you know, not, not very poor, but not very rich face is, you know, what kind of fiscal deficits can they afford to run? So I, I, think, I've, I think I've always been slightly less certain about whether UBI was the way to go because that's a huge outlay of resources. And, you know, there's a question of there are competing demands, for instance, many people in this audience would agree with it's on strengthening the health system that perhaps would have been, you know, are, are an important alternative. So one thing I have always been much more in favor of is, is well-designed well lending programs. So you can have, um, you know, uh, one, you know, you can try to think about subsidizing or supporting at a time like this, for instance, microfinance organizations or small banks better, who are in any case engaged with, uh, with, the, with poor households and have some notions of sustainability, or even if you're subsidizing them, it's not going to be as large 
as you're going to need to through UBI. So I think identifying those organizations or groups which are the natural points of um, where the poor turn to for resources at a time like this and figuring how to mainstream them and how to make that kind of lending more, more sustainable is probably an important part of what could be done right now. Uh, Ma'am, Pratima Tripathi has a question. What role can science communication play in the current situation? I mean, I think, I think science communication has a huge role to play, especially as we move into this, I guess, era of trying to get vaccinations in place, but vaccinations at a time when we are also seeing variants emerge, which is going to suggest that, you know, some, some vaccine may become less important. So I think a huge, in general, a huge question is how do you have trust in state and state institutions? And, you know, to what extent can science communication, um, you know, be in, can interact with the, with the state to both ensure that, you know, state activities on the scientific side are transparent enough and are also credible. And I would think that science communication, uh, you know, can help set standards for what is, what is um, you know, credible evidence and how it's used. Great. Uh, Sanjeev Kumar has a question on, do you see the democratic catch-22 situation resulting from the failure of policy technocrats? <coughs> he goes on to add, let's take just one example, all weather stations. How can the poor articulate the need for all weather stations when most do not know how the existence of the weather stations feed into the creation of the agricultural insurance market? And it is such poverty of imagination and domain knowledge, both on the part of the technocratic elites and the poor that pushes them to come to the street, sending jitters to the investment communities rather than put their demand to the global capital market where the real interest rate is hovering in the negative territory. There's a lot in that question and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer all of that, but I think I would say I'm, I'm pushing less on the failure of policy technocrats, but more on the limits of it. I, I, think, I think technocratic policy can deliver and has delivered important insights, but we, we may be asking of it something it's incapable of doing to say that it should go all the way to ensuring that citizen demands are heard. We need additional work for that. So again, I think like with all weather stations, it's you know, a lot of it is what people call the last mile issue. You should have all weather stations, but then you also have to figure out how that information gets out and how does it get to the citizens in the form that they will consume and use it. Um, so I think that's the extent to which we, you know, again, trying to always think about this in terms of um, how do we hear from those who are intended to be the consumers, um, you know, what then demands or needs are and how they would get to it is, is a critical part of what needs to happen. Okay, I'll take a question on the Q&A window. Uh, Sunindita Pan asks, do you think India is able to genuinely retain concept of democracy keeping in view present policies? So that's a very broad question. As I said, I think the, I really think the critical issue for us is to imagine democracy more broadly. I think I would say certainly as um, not just researchers, but also I think in the governance community, far too often democracy is linked just to the conducting of elections. Um, I think successful democracy requires a lot more than that. Um, you know, it's I think it's the title of that um, data collection organization, Varieties of Democracy captures it, is I think we have to recognize that, you know, what needs to be protected and built upon is more than just uh, elections. It's, it's a whole set of civil liberties and such like. I think that's important. Hmm. Abhishek and uh, Amlan have, has two questions and we'll wrap up from there. Uh, Madhuri, I think you are talking about tokenism um, and, and that probably is a little, uh, already touched by uh, Rohini in her, uh, some, one of our slides. Anyway, so Abhishek's question is about financial literacy. Is that an effective and efficient way to fight poverty? And uh, he goes on to give some examples. So I think, you know, one of the interesting questions of financial literacy is, at least from a research perspective, is while there's, I think, broad spread agreement, who cannot agree that financial literacy is important? We haven't seen... Uh, necessarily always how to do it well. Uh, one thing that I have worked on a bit in Madhya Pradesh and which seem to work, have some, some um, value is to complement a lot of the kind of bank account opening drives like the Jandhan Yojana or other ones with actual 
you know, taking those who you're giving these accounts to, to a CSP point or a bank point and getting them to uh, transact. Um, again, I think a lot of it is about ongoing information, not a one-off financial literacy. You know, for people who live perhaps a slightly far away from their bank branch or their customer service point, thinking about how they, they get, say, through SMS or through IVR systems, information on what's happening with their banking system. I think that that is a way of kind of taking the next step after a one-off training on financial literacy. Far too often right now, I think financial literacy is conceived as a short-term program where we tell people how banks uh, function or you know what compound interest rate is. But then it's not actually taking to the next step of saying we can also try to ensure continued engagement with the banking system and in the process, uh, you know, ensure that financial literacy is built upon. Mm -hmm. And Amlan's question is on the catch-22 of democracy related to reservation policies. He asks, uh, the reservation policies have given rise to significant backlashes from the privileged parts of society. So how do we solve such conflicts? I think it's hard. I don't, I, I don't think, at first, I think the most important thing is to recognize that there is a catch-22 and that sometimes when you give power to some groups or you give resources to some groups, those who lose out will uh, be unhappy. I think the question is, how do you create and along what dimensions do you create uh, shared interests? So for instance, you know, one example I often talk about is the expansion of the suffrage in the UK beyond the landed property owners. And what the evidence suggests that that actually happened in a point in time when citizens who had a lot of interest in moving beyond kind of private transfers to the provision of public goods, but also a point in time when cholera and typhoid were happening in the UK, but there was also increasing recognition that public goods like the sanitation system were important for it. So I think especially right now, one, one wants to say something hopeful about things like the global pandemic is that it has perhaps created some awareness that certainly on dimensions like health, climate change is another example, there is a set of shared interests. And perhaps building on that um, is going to be important. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rohini. I think uh, we can close. I know you have to run, this, uh, this might be a busy day. Uh, really, really appreciate your time for our seminar series. Uh, my computer skin has blanked out for some reason. I can only hear you. So Mini, why don't you thank uh, and close the Zoom window and thanks everyone for the questions. Yeah, thank you so much. And, yeah. Thank you, Professor Rohini Pandey. Thank you for the nice presentation. Yeah, thanks very much. And I answering really all the questions, invited. yeah. yeah. Thank thanks, you, Rohini. Thank Please you so stay much. safe and take good yeah, care. Yeah, you too, bye-bye. Bye-bye.